Center. But we're going to start with something that has been particularly important during this time of quarantine, how we game and entertain now. And to do that, I'm joined by Kathleen Breitman. Kathleen Breitman was a founder at Tezos and is now leading a very cool uh, startup focused on bringing blockchain gaming to reality. Kathleen, thanks for hanging out. Thanks for having me, and thanks for the gracious introduction. Sure. Okay, so uh, let's start with the the context and how you got from point A to point B. You built a base layer protocol and decided for your next act to focus on a blockchain game studio. What was it about games or, or the particular type of game that you're building that seemed like such a good fit for the blockchain? Oh, thanks for asking. And um, yeah, no, no one does any of these things alone, but um, I, I do get credit for co-founding uh, the Tezos blockchain, which launched back in 2018. Um, you know, once once uh, the network and the prevailing um, blockchain kind of got its sea legs in terms of seeing an ecosystem built around it, um, I began to think like, hey, you know, what's the coolest application um, that I think could be built um, that would you know be expedient and kind of testing out uh, the virtues of a cryptocurrency. And um, I think that smart contracts in particular do um, uh, do one thing really, really well. They help people coordinate um, and they can facilitate better secondaries markets. And so I wanted to kind of um, test that thesis out. Um, and I thought that the most broken, um, uh, fully digitized economy um, would, would be in gaming, um, which tend to have like sort of natural um, areas where um, people converge and try to coordinate themselves, um, which sounds a like a traditional economy, um, but has the benefit of not um, having to interact with the quote unquote real world and, you know, have this, this night tight digital loop. Um, it's funny because one of the, um, one of the largest contributors to the Tezos Foundation's 2017 fundraiser um, was actually a gaming company. And so I had a little bit of a head start in the sense that um, I was familiar with some of the working theses that this company had um, when they, um, when they started to look at a public blockchain as the source of, um, you know, potentially addressing some of the ills in their uh, native economy. Um, but I, I wasn't super um, convinced. Um, so I did a little bit of an informal survey of my own, and I looked at the different types of games that exist, and I thought that collectible card games um, in their digital format uh, suffered the most from, uh, I guess, uh, the break between how people understand their um, analog, you know, economies and games and their digitized models. So um, at Coast, um, you know, I like to say that we're not necessarily a gaming studio, but we really focus more on um, facilitating better secondaries markets. And the way we've decided to choose that um, uh, is, is through the production of an original collectible card game, um, though we're also looking at other um, aspects of collectible models and, and trying to create and you know, better secondaries markets work on them um, using smart contracts. So I, it's a bunch of bunch of interesting follow up questions. But for for people who aren't familiar, let's take it back to collectible card games because there's a precedent, and a lot of what I just heard from you is that this has to do with uh, trying to bring into digital parallel the the analog experience, right? And so in the history of collectible card games has this interesting kind of two part function where on the one hand there's players who get these cards and they play games with them and they make decks with them and they do all that stuff, but then there are these markets that form around them. And in fact, the markets have been a lot of how people have gotten interested in this domain, right? NPR doing series about uh, the Black Lotus and Magic the Gathering. So I guess one of the things that's really interesting to me uh, listening to you speak is that the logic for, for blockchain-based gaming has been uh, kind of... Uh, argued on a couple different levels. People have talked about both true digital ownership of goods, and they've talked about this idea of making easier secondary markets. So maybe you could speak to, it sounds like for you that the secondary markets piece is really important, but maybe that that implicates the, the first part, true digital ownership by definition. Could you speak a little bit to, uh, to kind of why that secondary market piece is such an important part of the theses for games on the blockchain? Yeah, absolutely. And that's um, <laughs> a very astute summation of um, <laughs> a lot of the ideas that I've had. Um, yeah, no, basically with with um, traditional collectible card games, such as um, Magic the Gathering being the most famous and the most notable, um, you know, typically in their analog versions, uh, people are like 50-50. You have this notion of like battle and, you know, actually playing the game. And then almost equally, you'll find if you go to a Magic convention or something like this, um, people are just really into collecting the cards and being able to trade um, and barter with people and kind of 
um, make friends um, to some extent. Like I think really what's driving this at the end of the day is the community around it. Um, you know, Fortnite now has uh, 350 million um, players, <laughs> which is insane. And, you know, um, 3.2 billion hours played in April alone. Um, you know, the, the people don't just come for the game itself. They also come to be with their friends. They come to show off. They come to express themselves. And I think, um, you know, one consistent line between Tezos and um, my thesis around Coast has been that if you empower people to kind of be able to make their own um, lot and to express themselves with using, um, you know, sort of the, the mechanisms and the um, incentives that you give them, like you really do wind up getting an impassioned um, group of folks. And so, yeah, to your point, um, you know, there's two axes of this. There's like the notion of actually owning um, a card, which which uh, a blockchain uniquely allows you to do and allows you to kind of port um, from one place to another. Um, one really cool thing that we can do with our game is, you know, publish an SDK and have you run alternative, you know, rules engines, right? And explore the same way that you could with a physical asset. Um, the other aspect of this is better coordination. And, um, you know, typically, um, where digital collectible card games have struggled is in making people feel like they've um, become smarter um, for putting money into the game or for you know buying a card um, because they they uh, you know typically can't um, trade these assets in a very um, I guess seamless fashion. But a blockchain might allow you to do that better. And using um, smart contracts, for example, um, to facilitate a secondaries market. Um, for these assets um, makes it a lot easier and programmatically, you know, liquid in the model that we proposed for our first game emergence. So it, it's really interesting. I'm going to out myself as a as a geek here. Obviously, you and I have talked about this in the past, and I, I started playing Magic in 1994 when I was 10 years old, and took a very long break, but then came back to it later in life, and have always been interested in in the the resilience, the resonance, the long term growth. Right. This is a game that's lasted now for 27 years, uh, you know, or longer, which is really unheard of in a, a lot of game dimensions. And one of the things that's fascinating, if you look at uh, historical antecedents in that ecosystem is the way in which the simple fact of it being this uh, this card game, right, with physical things, is that the community of people around it have invented a huge number of the most important parts of the ecosystem now, right? Wizards of the Coast, which is the company that publishes Magic, has said numerous times that one of the formats, so there's multiple ways to play Magic the Gathering, uh, and one of the formats that is most popular, perhaps the most popular, is called Commander, which was invented by judges and later became kind of pretty much one of the the biggest money makers for this company. The problem is that when you move from the 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 offline ecosystem where the rules are inherently kind of open to you doing whatever you want to the closed ecosystem of an online game, all that creativity goes out the window. And so one of the things that it sounds like to me listening to you is that you're almost trying to use some of the features of blockchain to build the capacity for people to design the system, to reinvent the system, to reimagine the system into the actual rules of the ecosystem. Is that, uh, is that accurate? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, you're picking up exactly what I'm what I'm putting down. Uh, so yeah, it's. I think um, I, I think it it comes from one thing that Hasbro does really really well um, in the context of Magic the Gathering. It has a tremendous amount of humility towards um, the people who constitute its its core demographic. Like it has a lot of reference for its end users, um, and uh, they've really preserved the. Um, Magic the Gathering brand um, by listening to the community and working largely in tandem with them. And so, um, you know, Hasbro gets the benefit of being able to publish new cards um, and to kind of add to this ecosystem, um, you know, have facilitate tournaments and so forth. Um, but they listen just as much as they as they write. And um, with the benefit of having um, you know, this this analog format is that they've they've picked up some really good tricks. Um, they haven't been able to, I, I think, um, uh, thread some of the needles when they've gone to digital formats um, by facilitating the same uh, creativity. Um, you know, maybe maybe if they went to a blockchain, they they would they would uh, find that a little easier. Um, but yes, the idea has been um, to allow you know to, to basically work really hard on creating original and compelling um, cards and um, you know cool stuff about the game in general. Um, obviously I have a lot of faith in my, my co-founders um, who know far more about this than I do. Um, but the, the main, the main uh, concession that we want to make and the main um, relationship we want to have with people who, who play the game um, is to facilitate the type of creativity and self-expression that um, Magic and other uh, CCGs were able to do um, seamlessly in the physical um, world, but to add on um, better economics through the use of a um, public blockchain to 
coordinate um, with the uh, you know second part of this, which is um, the facilitation of of uh, moving assets around in the game. So just just for uh, briefly, I think for people who are listening who are just thinking about this for the first time, what does it mean? How does a blockchain uh, mediate for real asset ownership, and how does that allow for uh, formal secondary markets to develop? Because I think that's a, that's a missing point, right? Like, what's different about a card in one of your games versus a card in Magic: The Gathering Online or Hearthstone, for example? Oh yeah, sure. Um, so basically. Uh, I, I suppose when these um, when these games were digitized or brought to the fore, um, they they did so using a sort of free to play model. Um, you know, basically you would you would grind and com complete tasks in order to earn credit. Um, towards towards um, purchasing assets in this game. Um, largely, the publishers of these games have restricted the movement of these assets once they are, um, you know, seized um, or purchased or whatever um, in, in the game. And so, consequently, you have um, a massive a massive tax on any sort of creativity. Um, you have a strong incentive to be very conservative in how you um, express yourself with these with these um, uh, I, I suppose strategies um, because you can't opt in and out of a card as easily um, because there's really no secondary use market. Or if there is one, it's um, taxed, you know, in the order of like 70% on the, um, you know, value of the card from when it was, uh, when it was purchased. Got it. So with your game, basically you officially make it, you make it easier for people to actually, that once they get a card, it's their asset, they can do whatever they want with it. Uh, and that's sort of not just uh, enabled, but supported or encouraged. Yeah. Um, what's more, we also have, um, you know, an auction and, and rental model um, that is uh, uh, tied to a token bonding curve, right? So we also use this sort of novel um, piece of technology that's that's been proposed um, from, you know, thinkers largely in the Ethereum community um, to, to have sort of like programmatic liquidity. So basically you can buy a card, you know, for... 20 bucks and you can, you know, theoretically sell it back, um, for like 1995 or whatever we, where we programmatically decide for it to be. Um, but the idea is you don't feel dumb, um, for having, uh, having kind of put your, put your, um, stake into like one card or another. Um, you know, you, you have the assurance, um, that you can kind of, um, experiment and, and move around freely. And we think that that's, that's really going to be appealing and actually addressing a huge problem in, um, the digital the digital space for these these types of games. Well, it's interesting. So bonding curves are one of these constructs that people hear about, and it seems kind of like the peak of theoretical, but not applicable to the real world, or, or maybe like a solution in search of a problem. But when we spoke previously, uh, one of your co-founders, V. Masowitz, who's a Magic Hall of Famer and is widely known as one of the most interesting thinkers in the history of the game, had basically come to a structure, something like a token bonding curve without knowing that that was what it was called, right? Yes, Zvi is a genius, and so no one is surprised that he would independently come up with all these ideas and many more <laughs> um, in the beautiful space that is his mind, which is pure and and uh, and and brilliant as it is. But yeah, no, Zvi is not just um, a professional Magic the Gathering player; he also actually has a background in financial economics. And so, um, what I really like about Zvi's background is. Um, if you're going to be introducing a marketplace into some place that typically hasn't had a free marketplace, um, you need a sort of way of thinking that's very adversarial. And um, Nathaniel, you would know more than more than most people who are probably tuning into this. Um, that's V is sort of famous in magic circles for being um, just a ferocious competitor and um, thinking 15 steps ahead of everyone else who's around him. So um, I, I'm, I feel like I'm in good hands um, on the design of the economic um, model and, and system, um, though obviously the proof will be in the pudding, um, you know, once we ho hopefully launch. <laughs> um, yeah. So, yeah. Okay, so let's let's zoom out a little bit. You mentioned Fortnite. You mentioned community happening. How have you seen COVID nineteen and these economic shutdowns shifted or accelerated our conversations around gaming and entertainment and community and what it all means? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, this the sad part is that um, you know many people are stuck at home. Um, a lot of people are are uh, I, I guess looking into ways to preoccupy themselves that are wholesome and nice and uh, kind of take away from the uh, dreariness that is the world right now. Um, and so, at least in the context of paying attention to collectible card games as a as a genre, um, there's been a bit of a resurgence in tabletop games and um, and and these types of formats. Um, and so I, I suppose it ties back to community. It ties back to like, um, feeling human again. Um, and, uh, I think gaming, game, gaming has always been like a social, 
um, you know, social network um, in some ways if you're if you're part of something sufficiently big and interesting. Um, but what's nice about the internet is it it it, it, it can give you a reprieve um, from the uh, you know rather depressing situation that we're all facing right now, um, and it gives you just some, something to talk about other than uh, fake news articles on Facebook or whatever whatever people do um, on social network these days. Yeah, well, it's interesting too, because even going back right from the beginning, when you're talking about the design of uh, this game, which your first game is called Emergence, right? Um, I don't think we yeah. even mentioned that. Um, it, it really is, you're designing an entire ecosystem, right? You're designing an entire economy that happens to be anchored by a set of assets, a set of cards, and a set of rules that dictate gameplay. But you really have to think about the design of the whole ecosystem. And it reminds me of how uh, one of the things that we've seen is Fortnite, for example, moving into this variety of other different uh, experiences, right? So Fortnite ceases to be just a game, you know, uh, a battle royale game, and instead becomes a whole set of things where you can take your avatar, you can take your character into this virtual space, into this shared virtual space, and do interesting things, right? And so we've seen concerts, we saw Marshmallow before the crisis, we saw Travis Scott during it. But now I think that they just didn't they just release a new uh, world, I think, or a new plane, I'm, I'm not actually that super familiar with, with Fortnite and how it's organized, but they introduce an area that's not for guns at all, right? It's for literally like hanging out and uh right and, and i just wonder how much these how much this time is going to provide kind of the the accelerant for people to think about these virtual spaces in a different way yeah yeah you know i i explicitly didn't want to get involved in anything that was sort of an rpg because effectively you're running a movie studio um <laughs> uh and and i just don't have enough money um uh, on hand <laughs> to uh to, to play that game um, so obviously it, it appeals to a certain demographic. Um, in some ways it's, it's more, um, widely appealing than, uh, collectible card games, which, you know, have a pretty high, have a pretty high tax up front in, in understanding how to, how to play. But if you do, you get like, you know, sufficient depth and, and, um, I suppose user engagement at some level. Um, but, uh, but yeah, no, I, I, I think sort of breaking, um, breaking this down and, and giving people, um, a forum where they can have the sort of collective experiences that we, um, you know, a few generations back would often have through through kind of television and um, and more um, traditional means um, is is kind of like the 21st century, um, you know, watching the the man, uh, you know, walk on the moon type of type of thing that everyone can kind of reference together um, and uh, and having these like shared experiences like you know the the massive. Mm -hmm. um, um, Travis Scott concert in Fortnite, right? And it, it, that's it's kind of nice that we're able to have that as a um, society again. So by, by way of wrapping up, just kind of one more ponderous question, I guess. Uh, what's one thing, when you look at the reality of entertainment or gaming in the time of these COVID-19 shutdowns, what's one thing that you think will go away, maybe retreat and go back to normal, some experience that people have or something, some way that people are acting? And what's one thing that's a more permanent change about how we think about entertainment or, or gaming? Um, that's a great question. And I, I, I wish I had more conviction in my answer, but I guess I'll just um, kind of back into the more milk toast um, observation that I think people didn't think of um, people didn't think of games as social social networks as much um, anymore, because there are, you know, basically social networks like Twitter um, and Facebook that have come to the fore over the last few years. Um, I think games are kind of a unique opportunity to bring back um, a more wholesome version um, where, you know, your interactions aren't solely expressing your opinion. It's also like going through problems together. Um, and I think that can be quite nice. Um, and I, I do hope there's more of that um, because I think it's more for, more family friendly for starters. Um, and it also it also kind of reflects the reality that we're, we're all in this together. Um, and I think now more than ever, uh, we're, we're acutely aware of um, how dependent we are on our neighbors and um, sort of communities um, to keep ourselves safe and, and to um, uh, protect people who are more vulnerable. And it's kind of nice that um, gaming can be part of um, a more positive story, whereas I think culturally um, over the last few years, it's gotten a pretty bad rap. Yeah, it's a. Uh, it is interesting to see this big shift from, you know, again going back to those early days when uh, my parents were seeing stories about magic being satanic to uh, this very different place that gaming has in the world. Um, Kathleen, where can people find? Uh, <laughs> Hmm? Um, that, they, that just makes it more appealing to 13 year old boys. <laughs> I know. Um, seriously. It's like, you guys don't know. This is like the best branding that you could possibly have. Yeah. Um, <laughs> for, for people who want to learn, uh, what, what's one thing that people should know about, about emergence itself, about the game. And for people who want to actually experience this, where can they go for updates and to pay attention? Oh yeah. Please sign up for our mailing list at emergence.gg, um, as in, as in good game. 
And um, if you want to learn more about the philosophy behind its own and so forth, you can visit our main company website, which is coa.se. So co in um, the economist Ronald. Um, so thank you very much for, for giving me the opportunity to plug it. I, I feel like a bad CEO for not even mentioning the name of the game uh, several minutes into the interview, but um, I'm learning, I'm iterating, <laughs> um, try, awesome. trying my best. <laughs> thank you for being here, Kathleen. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks so much. Take care.